So with that out of the way, let's, let's keep reading now and see some of the information that we receive here that we didn't receive in Matthew. Verse number three. So for, the first thing we see is that he's in Bethany, but he's, he's, he's having this meal with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This is the same meal. We didn't even get that from Matthew 26. But Lazarus, Jesus had already raised him from the dead. And now he's sitting there at meat with them. And this is another one of the things that drove the chief priests and the Pharisees crazy is because when he performed that miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, after he was dead for four days, that made some, a very significant impact on a lot of people. Because people knew Lazarus. People knew he was dead. People saw him. You know, he was put in the grave. Jesus came. He wasn't even around. Jesus showed up on purpose late because he knew that all this was going to happen. He called him and said, Lazarus, come forth. He came forth out of the grave. And all these people saw this great miracle of Lazarus. That I mean, he should have been stinking after four days. And that's what they said in the Bible. You know, by now he stinketh. <laughs> because he should, his flesh should be rotting. Because he was dead for so long. But it wasn't. Jesus called him forth and healed him completely and raised him from the dead. That's a big deal. And not only did people want to have supper with Jesus, but they also wanted to have supper with, with Lazarus. They're like, let's see this guy who's raised from the dead and eat with him. Like, what? You know, people were probably watching him at, like, right after he's raised from the dead. What's going to happen? Like, can, he, can he eat food? Right? Like, like is his, all his organs, everything's working right? You know? Kind of keep an eye on him. But, uh, but they, they were excited about that. And again, that was another thing that just that infuriated these wicked people that hated Jesus because that added so much more um, clout to what Jesus was saying. It just added so much more power behind who he was, right? The fact that he's, that he's raising someone from the dead. I mean, who could do that, right? How could anyone do that without the power of God being with them? Look at verse number three. It says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So now we see, it doesn't say anything about pouring it on his head. It says she wiped his feet and used her hair to do it. And we see that it's Mary, right? But again, this is no contradiction. This is just more information than what was given to us in the other account. Did she pour the ointment on Jesus' head? Yes. Did she wipe his feet with it? Yes, they're both true. She did both. She did both. She anointed his feet. She wiped his feet with her hair. Now think about this. She's pouring it on his head. She's, she's you know, all of this great, you know, this great humility and honoring of Jesus Christ. How wicked do you have to be to start just railing on the woman doing this? Right? I mean, she's just going all out honoring Jesus Christ here. We, we, I mean, can you imagine taking the, your hair and, and wiping someone's feet? Someone's dirty feet, right? That takes some humility to get down low enough to his feet to be able to do that. I mean, even, even with long hair, right? I mean, she's still just, just, just down there wiping off his feet, cleaning him up. That, that takes a lot of humility and, and really was a show of love for Jesus Christ. But then look at what it says in verse number four. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now we see who's behind the murmuring and the complaining and the railing. Now, it wasn't just Judas. Because we saw in Matthew that his disciples, plural, were, were saying these things. But Judas is the one that started it. Judas is the one that planted this thought in the minds of other people. Yeah, huh? Why, why didn't we say, you know, use this money for, to feed the poor? That's a good idea, Judas. You know, why didn't we do that? But it comes from the heart of this wicked man. And Jesus said in verse number six, this he said, not that he cared for the poor. He didn't even care about the poor. He said, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there. But this is how false prophets work and how reprobates work. You got, you got to be aware of this. Judas is a prime example of a traitor, of someone who creeps in privily, unawares, as Jude says, as 2 Peter chapter 2 says, 
Read those chapters, know those chapters. If you want to be aware of people who sneak in, wicked people that sneak in to good churches around people of God who are trying to do God's work that come in to bite and devour and destroy. Judas didn't care about poor people, yet he makes this comment that sounds real spiritual. Oh, the poor people. And how many times do you hear wicked people in this world saying, oh, but the poor people in Africa. Oh, but the poor people here. And you know in their heart they're really wicked people. And they do abominable things. They don't care about the poor people. Judas didn't care about the poor people. Judas was a thief. All he cared about was selling that ointment so that he could get his hands on the money and that he could take his, his share that he was stealing and, and put the rest in the bag and take his own share off of that. He looked at that as money going down the drain in his own pocket. 